welcome to the nerd party. Ah, oh, Miles here. Your owl post for the week has been freshly delivered, and I am just one of the hosts here, Matthew Rushing, and with me, as she is always, the dulcet toned Drea Kaufman. Hello! Ooh. I tried to make a funny voice so it wasn't so dulcet toned, just because I thought that would be <laughs> funny, but I don't know that it worked, so. <laughs> Dang my well, cursed tone! Yeah. Right, well, sorry. we are back, and, um, you know. We're here before Thanksgiving as we're recording in the U.S., so that's kind of exciting. And that's right. Just, even though it's going to be a holiday, we're still getting your episodes out to you folks because that's how much we love you. And so make sure you love us back. Hit us up with a star rating review on Apple Podcasts. Also, make sure you're subscribed wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at Join Nerd Party. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash the nerd party. And if you go to the nerdparty.com, you can send us an email and just make sure you go to the contact section and choose Outpost. And that email comes to Drea and I. So we are at chapter nine, Drea, and it's the title of the book, The Half Blood Prince. And the chapter starts with Harry telling Hermione and Ron what he heard in the Hogwarts Express from Malfoy. And I thought that this was an interesting conversation because it's, you know, the two sides, of the other sides of the Trinity have different feelings on this, which was, it was kind of nice to finally see somebody think that Harry might not be just crazy. Yeah, and it's weird that it's Hermione because that's kind of the opposite of what we're used to seeing. Yes, yes. Um, but... Honestly, she kind of gives the opposite, but doesn't, and then also doesn't really give it much thought all at the same time. So it's it's kind of an interesting exchange. You know, she kind of believes him, but doesn't really know what to do about it or what it means or anything like that. And that's, I think that's hard for her to to do. So she kind of is like, oh yeah, maybe. I mean, that's weird. Okay, schedules <laughs> and moves like right into mm-hmm. schoolwork. So, um. It's kind of one of those things where, like, there's a reason why those roles are usually reversed. So it's really, really interesting to see them that way. Um, but it, it is, I, I do feel better that someone sort of finally is giving a little bit of weight to Harry's theory, hypothesis, idea, paranoia. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. Um, so it's really, it's really great to see that. Um, and I feel like Hermione's one who she'll get it. She'll kind of file it away and slowly work it into something. Like she's not going to just blow him off. She just takes kind of a subtler approach than maybe Ron does. Who kind of go in guns blazing. She'll kind of plan and plot and use that for a longer term, you know, strategy. Um, but yeah, it's nice that someone finally gets it's like vindication for Harry a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and in a lot of ways, it's just finally having somebody give credence to Harry's thought, you know, like, it, right. which not that credence, not, not, not the credence from, <laughs> from <laughs> the uh, Fantastic B series. But, um, you know, I just, I think it's, it's pretty nice. Like you were just saying that, that somebody is giving any kind of validity to what Harry is saying. And this is also just a really funny section because after they kind of like, Stop talking about that. They're doing their their duties as prefects and sixth years. And Ron is going on about how exciting it's going to be to be a sixth year because they actually have free time this year. And I just kind of love how that um, doesn't last too long because the free time they thought they were going to have is not as much free time because, well, they find out from McGonagall as she's going through everybody's schedule with them to make sure they have the right amount of owls to progress into new level classes, um, they find out that they can take, uh, that that Harry can take potions because, you know, 
Professor Slughorn will accept the exceeding expectations that he got, which I thought was, you know, we 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 get that. That's really cool. Um, and right before that, I love the way that she interacts with um, Neville, and that scene there was even more important to me than what we learned for Harry, honestly, because Neville is kind of being put down by his grandmother again, and McGonagall just poo-poos that whole thing about how, you know, Neville's grandmother should be proud to have a grandson like him. And maybe she didn't like Charms, because you can remind her that just because she failed her Charms owl doesn't mean that it's not useful. And I was just like, wow, McGonagall really stepped it up here for good old Neville. Um, I I just loved that. I thought it was great. Yeah, I really like, she kind of goes mama bear (laughs) on Neville. Yes, she does. Um, uh, actually on Neville's grandmother. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I do, I do really love that she's just like fierce about it with him because, you know, he, he deserves it, you know? And I think that everyone's starting to, well, everyone, I mean, like really important characters are really starting to connect and support all of this kind of cast that's growing a little bit, right? This inner circle. Um, and it's, it's so great to see Neville, someone who we don't think gets that support elsewhere, to get that from someone and for it to be so brazen. Um, it, yeah, it's definitely the highlight of that section for sure. Um, I really loved seeing that, um, especially considering it was like Hermione just slid it off super qu- super quickly off to wherever. Um, the other thing I thought was really funny in this section was um, that Pavardi Patil asks who's teaching um, tra- or not transfiguration. I'm sorry. Who is teaching um, divination this semester? And, um, you know, she's like, oh, is Ferenz teaching? And she's like, no, she's split it. He's splitting with Trelawney and you have Trelawney. And she's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, that was really funny. I did really like that. It was nice. Yeah. Uh, this is, I, I think, you know, it's such an interesting chapter because in many ways the the school for these students is changing you know you get the feeling here they really truly have grown up and um you know it's going to be a much different year but it, we also realize too it's going to be a busy year for them because they're working towards their newts you know taking those tests and it's going to be a big deal and as big as the deal of the that the owls were Newts are even bigger, and so um, all of these classes that they're they're going to be pursuing. Then this really has to do with what they're going to be able to do then after they leave school. You know what kind of job they'd be able to get. Um, that is, if Voldemort doesn't kill everyone. Yeah, I find it so interesting that that's it's such a different perspective on school than say what we have in America, where high school almost doesn't matter. <laughs> like you show up and if you graduate, that's really all. And, you know, getting into a college is kind of important, but there's really no talk or development of any sort of post primary education type education. Um, It's just, this is it, you know, you get, it's kind of real life training and schooling at the same time. And, you know, I love that they only take the best of the best, um, in certain areas. And I think that's, it's such a unique take on education that we definitely don't have reflected here in the United States that, you know, it it makes it relatable, but at the same time, it makes it kind of like unusual and you want to know what's going on. And it adds this element of, Oh gosh, it's the rest of their lives to high school. It is very different from the way that we kind of think of things here in the U S and, you know, we kind of know from other places in the wizarding world, you know, there are extensions, there are things that people can go on to um, school wise, uh, even after Hogwarts, you know, they're, they're especially around their job, you know, there's, there's training that goes on beyond that, but really this is kind of the, the main end of school for most of them. And so it is really incumbent on them to do well. And so I thought it was fun that, you know, Ron and Hermione, that Ron and Harry actually do have a break. Um, so they don't actually have to go to class and then they all go to uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts, which is very different this year because it's being taught by Snape. 
And one of the things that we kind of mentioned, a couple of things happened in the tr- this this part where I thought was really interesting. One, we get a chance to see some portraits that Snape has of evil creatures and or the unforgivable curses. So we the students actually get to see what Inferi look like. Um, and we talked about the idea of nonverbal spells, and he starts this class off, but their first thing is to try and learn how to do nonverbal spells against what, one another, which this is big. I mean, this is something, this is like a whole new level of their or wizarding education and what it means to do magic. And we also learn this is not something that every wizard can do anyway. Like not every wizard is able to do this well or at all. So that's fascinating too. Yeah. So this is something that I feel like really makes a difference in the books and in the movies. So we talk a lot about like maybe plot wise, what's missing from the movies and things like that. But in this instance, here's a pretty big thing that, so in the movie, there's never really an acknowledgement that some people can do spells without talking. It's always sort of an age thing, Mm -hmm. right? Like the kids talk, the adults don't. Um, So it's sort of this idea that they'll eventually learn how to get there. And by the end of the whole series, they're there, right? No, I'm not spoiling anything. Sorry if I did. But in the book here, it really is a matter of ability and it really is a matter of talent and skill. Um, And so that kind of really paints a picture across the board that even these Death Eaters are fairly talented wizards and witches, right? And, And same with the Order of the Phoenix. It really sort of paints, takes all of these fighting entities and moves them to a new level right they're not just any old witch or wizard off the road they have to have a certain ineptitude to do or a certain aptitude to do these things that we don't ever get depicted anywhere else and so it's really interesting to have that element added like hey you have to be a good you have to be good at what you do in order to do this thing that seems fairly straightforward and simplistic um and so i really like that we get this here because i think this is really the tipping point you know, all along the way, we've been talking about these kids are kind of no longer kids. But the fact of now I feel like we have a milestone that once they're able to sort of start casting these spells without speaking, we've really kind of turned a corner into the type of witches and wizards they're going to be. Um, so I really like that that is so simple, but it really lays the groundwork. And it can kind of continues over from the last chapter where Harry is desperately trying to cast a spell uh, without using words and he's still struggling. So it gives us kind of a benchmark to start at and it'll be interesting to see how long it takes us to get to the end. End. This is also a place where, because we have Snape teaching a subject which, you know, Harry is very good at, um, Harry's a little extra cheeky in this class when Snape is going to use him as an example. And he's not going to have any of that after the Occlumency lessons last year. And so he goes to use the non verbal spell. Snape does, and before he can even do anything, basically, Harry has already got his shield charm up, which almost knocks Snape over. Uh, and this whole thing, he's like, um, don't you remember we are practicing nonverbal spells? And he says, yes. And then I love that Snape says, yes, sir. And, I, and Harry says, oh, there's no need to call me sir, Professor. And it just like it's I love the moment because she describes it as that it has escaped his mouth before he even knew what he was saying. And we saw this earlier in the book with his interaction with Mrs. Malfoy. So something in Harry has kind of changed with people that he sees as being on the other side. I have this feeling that he just doesn't he's done being the victim. Like he's done being the punchline he's done taking the high road like now he's at the i'm gonna fight backstage um which is kind of why i feel like he's gotten a lot punchier Mm -hmm. well and what's kind of interesting too is that you know he gets attention and then this whole thing they have this conversation with the kids you know you get ron harry and hermione talking about this and it was really interesting the way hermione approached this because she, I think, 
she throws something at Harry that he's not expecting whatsoever. Where she, you know, tells him, look, the way that Snape was talking about defense against the dark arts feels very similar to the way you were talking about, you know, facing Voldemort and how it's more than just memorizing all these spells. And Harry's so taken aback that Hermione has memorized something that he said and thought it was important that he doesn't even, like, look to argue, which is kind of hysterical because he's just blown away that his friend actually has paid attention to him in that way and thinks that he did say anything important, which, you know, um, I think... I don't know. I I didn't... it, It seemed like one of those places where... Hermione said exactly the right thing she needed to do to make her point that Harry couldn't, like, come back at. Which I just... It was a really interesting moment in in the book. Because to say that Harry and Snape have any kind of similarities seems like, you know, anathema. And yet, here we see that they actually do kind of sound similar when it comes to the idea of dark arts and, and what it means to fight that. Yeah, um, I I totally agree. I also think there's a part of this going on here. We've talked a little bit about this feud that they have um, that Harry and Snape have, but I do really think that part of what makes it so bitter is the fact that I think that they're more alike than either of them want to admit. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think this is also a little bit of her maybe pointing that out. Um, And I think because she knows, I mean, she's seen firsthand in kind of the last book, how angry Harry can get and how out of control he gets when he's angry. And I think a little reminder of trying to engage a little bit of that empathy and a little bit of that putting yourself in their shoes and bringing a little human element to things or a little wizard element to things, um, I think helps to calm Harry too, because it's his own words thrown back at him. How is he going to refute that? Right. And the way she delivered it, you're totally right. was spot on. It's exactly what he needed to hear in that moment. And, um, I think it really just helped. It's going to kind of plant that seed that he's going to stew on and think about a little bit. Um, I don't think we're ever going to have a, a Harry Snape impasse at any point. I don't think we're going to get to the point where like, they see their common ground and can work together, you know, consciously about something. But um, I think just a, a little reminder that some of the things he says still has value and, you know, he can hate him, but it's still important to listen. And it sounds like he's actually maybe going to be good at teaching this, um, you know, and I think it's also her way of, she knows this is probably Harry's favorite subject and she wants to make sure that he doesn't completely lose it. Like, lose that love for this pat this subject right that he has still has a little bit of an interest and a desire to be there even if it's taught by his least favorite person in the world but yeah, yeah it's this it's this little tender moment that they have and she's like okay bye and runs off <laughs> well and uh i think that's the thing that's really kind of interesting um about this because you know they are going to learn something here from snape that's really important which is to do nonverbal spells so to see how these kids are able to do that And we already know, too, we get this little moment before they head into potions. They run into Ernie McMillan, and he's talking about how, you know, shield charms are old hat for the the DA kids, you know, who uh, who were in Dumbledore's army. And so we know that these kids can learn this stuff because they were able to apply themselves to learn magic that was difficult for many people to do. You know, like the idea of doing, they were all... performing their full-blown Patronuses by the end of the term last year. So they can do this. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how many of them can pull it off. And so we get to potions where Slughorn, you know, Harry's like, um, well, you know, Ron and I didn't know we were coming uh, and going to be in this class. And he's like, oh, yeah, just get what you need out of the cupboard. You can get, you know, right to flourish and blots and get what you need later. And they each pull out these old books, which is very different than the movie, where they're fighting over, you know, um, one good book and one crappy book. And they both pick up random books 
And I think they're assigned the books. Yeah, he I just hands Slughorn, it to him. Yeah, it just hands it to him. They don't even get to pick. They don't. They're not even. They're just. They're given a book. Yes, and so yeah, uh, and then I just like this moment because we get this place where Hermione ended up complimenting Harry earlier by remembering something that he had said, and the same thing is going to happen here when she becomes a star in this class. And Slughorn's like, oh, you're the witch that Harry Potter was talking about. And she's just kind of like flushed because, you know, somebody's been mentioning her to a professor and it's made her look good. And she he's like, of course, you, I, I would tell anybody that you were the best witch in, in our year because you are. <laughs> but the cutest part about all of this is Ron jumping in and being like, I would have told anybody too if they'd asked. Like yes. I would say the same thing. <laughs> like it was so it was such a feeble attempt to be like, Hey, I'm a part of this too, guys. Hey, hey. Yeah, it's <laughs> it was, pretty funny. It was really cute. Um, yeah, I do I do really like that. And it's nice to see a teacher recognizing Hermione too because we've had lots Mm -hmm. of books where she's super smart and the teachers are like great great let's move on or teachers are mean to her like Snape's always been very mean to her when she knows something right Um, and this is kind of the first time where a teacher is like actively impressed and shows it and expresses like oh you're great and plays into it right because he Mm kind of keeps pulling on her and having her share and oh I bet you know what this is and I just think that's so sweet and I think that's such a good element for a teacher to show that we haven't it kind of shows you we haven't had a lot of really good teachers at least we haven't experienced the classroom of a lot of good teachers yet yeah Um, because that's so it's so good to to fuel that a little bit right and to see that and to nurture it instead of just treating her like it's this bad thing which is what all a lot of the other teachers we've been in class with Hermione have done Um, so I do really like that it's a good way of encouraging her to keep growing and doing and telling her she's on the right track Um, and then it does lead to that touching little moment with the Trinity and her getting to feel you know, it shows just that relationship is so reciprocal um, and that they really are good together. Um, so, you know, we'll, I'm sure we're going to get a Ron moment here in the next few chapters too of what he brings to the table because I think that's important to balance it all out. But um, it it was such a nice little moment. Um, and I do love that when they start actually brewing the potion, right? Because we learn a lot about a couple of different types of potions we learn about a love potion and a polyjuice potion which i like that you know harry calls back to the second book where mm-hmm. hermione had brewed her own polyjuice potion and that's a newt level uh potion we learn right like holy moly um the we also learn about the so love potion luck potion the transmorphing potion i thought there was a fourth one um that's slipping my mind right now um but I do love that um, we kind of learn a little bit about these different potions and what they do and the, the specifics around them. Um, and we learn things like the luck potion only lasts for about 12 hours per tablespoon. Mm-hmm. And if you take too much, it can be toxic and it's banned and like sporting events and gambling and things like that. Um, and so then, you know, we start making it. Um, and I love that Harry complains about the book he got and all of, and he says it's basically as black in the margins as it is on the pages. Yeah, that's the that's the funny thing I loved about this is that immediately Harry is annoyed because somebody wrote all over his book and it's hard to read the instructions. But then he starts reading the instructions that have been written in the book and then he does a few of them and they turn out great and he could not be more happy because He's finally good at a subject that he's never been good at before. Part of that is that Snape was teaching the class, so he was never going to be... I mean, he already got exceeds expectations, right? He's he's already he, decent Yeah, he was never class. bad at it. He just was never particularly good at it, right? Like, he had never really had a teacher who showed mm-hmm. him he was good at it. So... um this was kind of the first time where he felt successful in potions, yep. even if he maybe already was. And this is an interesting thing to me, too, because it also shows that for Harry, with the right instructions, he's excellent at this. Like, he follows the instructions to a letter and is able to do so in the same way Hermione is able to do with the instructions in the normal book. 
But here, with the extra help that he's getting from this person, whoever it was that wrote this, um, he's able to do exceedingly well. And I think that's just something that's really interesting. And it also is like, it seems like if you know what you're doing, potions is not a super difficult class or should not be a super difficult class. Um, but you have to seem, it seems like you have to be very organized in this class and you have to be paying attention all the time, you know, be, you know, you have to be a paid, you know, to be counting if you're doing it, you know, how many stirs you're doing and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, teenagers aren't necessarily good at having good attention spans, but here her, the, you, we see characters like Hermione and Harry being actually able to excel here, even though Hermione's isn't quite as good because she's just following the normal instructions and Harry has the super instructions. <laughs> yeah, I feel a little bit like potions is baking and yeah, Defense Against yeah. the Dark Arts and some of the rest of them are a little more like cooking. They can be have a little more flair and a little more off the hip. And there's a little more wiggle room there where, you know, potions is so exact. It's like baking or some other science where they have to follow everything the way it is. But there's also some people who have this knack for it and can understand what makes that better, which is what I'm feeling like those comments in the margin are. They're essentially doing the same thing the, the recipe, if you will, tells you to do but they're able to understand it and take it to the next level. And I think that's where someone who's good at potions or who is kind of naturally has this natural inclination, that is where they excel. They not only can follow the instructions, but they can take those detailed instructions to the next level. Um, so I really feel like that is where you get someone who has a knack for potions um, versus someone who can just do them. But I do mm. love that it shows Harry sort of has a natural inclination for most anything he tries. He can be very good if he tries right. um, and if he's supported and if he's taught, which is why he struggled in potions before because he didn't have that all the time. And that breaks down your confidence, which mm. then breaks down your ability to try and there you have it. So I do really love seeing him succeed at something that historically has been so difficult for him. And he sort of dreaded that class. Um, so, and, and I do love that when they leave potions after he wins this, you know, luck serum um, and they go to the table and he's showing, I think he's showing Ron and Hermione, the book that Ginny literally loses her mind when she hears him say that he took instructions from a book literally mm -hmm. loses her mind and i love that moment because yeah. it's so uncharacteristic for Ginny. well i like that this happens quickly in the yeah. story it's not something that happens later and i love that she's mad for a good reason because obviously the last time any of them took advice from a book you know the chamber of secrets was open so she has a very good point and so of course you know hermione checks the book you know and doesn't seem to be anything other than a book and even Hermione is like yeah it just seems like a book that somebody wrote all over and Harry's like are you are you okay are you cool Ginny and she's like yeah it's fine whatever you know but I love that there was a moment there where we do really see her being worried and, and she has every right to be because her point is completely valid and the last thing we learn as Harry you know hides his bottle of Felix Felicis, um, he sees in the book that this book apparently is property of the Half-Blood Prince. And that's where we leave the chapter it, with this mi another mystery. So, you know, we have a few mysteries going on, and now the mystery will be, who is this person? Oh, and I, and I love... Every time they say the Half-Blood Prince and I think of the movie title, I instantly go to that Family Guy clip where they're like, I love when they say the name of the movie in the movie. He -he -he -he. She said it every time I read the name of the book in the book. I go, ha, mm -hmm. they said it every time, every time. Yeah. So I'm I'm excited. You know, um, chapter 10 coming up. We've got the House of Gaunt uh, with the first meeting between uh, Harry and Dumbledore coming up, which is one thing that we skipped, but it's he got the note that he's supposed but to meet now with. We did it. Yeah, he, <laughs> he's supposed to meet with uh, Dumbledore on Saturday for their first private lesson, which 
obviously leaves you excited in this chapter. What is he going to be teaching him? But you will have to wait till next week when we get there. So, Drea, where can people find you if they want to catch up with you uh, and see what's going on in life and talk some Harry Potter? Sure, you can find me on Twitter at PCFChick or on Instagram at Drea Kaufman, and it's C-O-F-F-M-A-N. And you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterbox, Vero, under the name MattRushing02. I am here on the network. I do a show called Aggressive Negotiations with John Mills, where we talk about Star Wars each and every week. I do two shows on the Trek FM network. One is called The Orb with Chris Jones. When we get a chance, we record and we talk about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. I do the 602 Club, which is our general geek show. We talk about all of the fandoms we love. It's been so much fun this year. We've had so much going on. But we only have a few episodes left. Um, It's crazy. We've got about a month left of of new releases and things coming out. Of course, Star Wars, Jumanji, Star Wars stuff. It's crazy. So check it out. And last but not least, you can find me on Cinema Stories, talking about films through the lens of faith with my good friend Courtney. But thank you so much for checking your outpost. Mischief managed. Join the revolution. Join the nerd party.